Hi everyone, and welcome to the Chapter 4 lecture for Medical Terminology. Chapter 4 is all about pulmonology, which is the study of the lungs. And you do a little word surgery and you can figure that out. We also call the this system, this body system that's studied by pulmonologists, the respiratory system. Respiratory literally means pertaining to breathing again and again and again on repeat, which is what respiration is. You are breathing in and out, in and out, in and out, over and over again. So this system has much fewer parts than the previous one, the gastrointestinal system, which had several organs. All right, this one, we're just gonna talk about um, the air passageways and the lungs and the branches and alveoli within the lungs. So since this is a chapter about the respiratory system and since we are entering flu season, um, flu shots are, I think, now available, if not very, very soon. Um, so this is my PSA, public service announcement reminder to get your flu shot. Um, I have not gotten mine yet as I'm making this video, but by the time you view the video, I probably will have gotten it. I usually get it the first week of October. Um, just is just how, how I usually do it. Um, but, uh, so, um, if you get your flu shot, text me a picture. I'll probably message you guys a picture when I get mine. So message me a picture when you get yours. And I like this little, uh, cartoon about the flu shot. <clears throat> All right, so my term of the day for this chapter, it's a two-parter that I think is hilarious, and this is supposed to be an animation, but it's not working. Um, but it's a it's an animation, like a little gif of a girl picking her nose and eating her boogers. All right, there's literally medical terms for those. Rhinotelexis is the medical term for picking your nose. Rhino means nose, and telexis is a habit of picking. And mucophagy is the medical term for eating your boogers. Muco, mucus. Phagy, like phago, is a process of eating or swallowing. So we mostly think of it in our culture as being very taboo and a gross thing to do. But there's actually some evidence that it boosts your immune system, that by eating your boogers, you're, you're swallowing bacteria, um, and viruses that are found in your nasal cavity, and it's helping you to um, make protective um, immune responses towards them. And that also some of those bacteria may actually help protect your teeth and prevent cavities. So next time you catch your kid picking their nose and eating it, maybe no need to yell at them for it. Maybe it's a normal natural function that's actually part of our immune system. A lot of other primates do it as well in animals. So there, there is um, from a, from a uh, evolutionary perspective, um, the, this idea that maybe it is actually beneficial if so many creatures do it, have evolved to do it, um, then maybe not such a bad thing. But now you know the medical terms for them. All right, so the respiratory system is made up of the parts here. So it's divided into an upper respiratory system and the lower respiratory system. The nasal cavity is where air goes in or through the mouth. And then it goes down through the pharynx, past the pharynx, the throat, and past the larynx, the voice box, into the trachea, which we commonly call the windpipe. So you should know and be able to match those terms. Pharynx is throat, larynx is voice box, trachea is windpipe. And then the windpipe splits at the bottom into the two bronchi, where air enters the right and left lungs. So everything from the neck down is part of the lower respiratory system, and everything basically in the head is part of the upper respiratory system. So when we talk about infections of the respiratory system, we often break them up uh, between the upper respiratory infections and lower respiratory infections. A little bit about respiration, what it is, what, what is breathing, and some medical terms around respiration. So respiration is breathing. You can breathe in or breathe out. We call that inhalation or inspiration, because halo and spiro are both synonymous combining forms that mean to breathe, and or exhalation and expiration. So in means to take air in, and ex means to move it out. Um, or away from. So 
uh, either one. Um, a normal breathing rate is known as eupnea. Pneo is another combining form for breathe. So there's three different combining forms that are synonymous that mean breathe. And you, if you recall, is a prefix that means good or normal. So when a doctor is doing an exam or a nurse or any medical pr practitioner is doing a physical exam and notes that the breathing is normal, it's important to chart that, to note that you did look at their breathing rate and that it was normal. So they might be charted as having eupnea. Um, the nasal cavity, let's start going through, walking through the anatomy of the respiratory system. So you take air in through your mouth sometimes, but also mostly through your nose. And when it goes in through your nose, it actually spins around in the nose through these little bony structures called turbinates. And turbinates are things that air spins around. We also have turbines as like energy sources um, or wind sources. Uh, so the air spins around there and does that for two reasons. One, it helps to warm up the air to the correct body temperature before going into the lungs. So as not to, especially when it's cold out, that's important. So as not to lower your body temperature, your core body temperature. Um, but the other thing it does is it allows the air to spin around and um, for particulates that you breathe in, like allergens, pollen, viruses, bacteria, gives them the opportunity to get trapped in these traps that are within your nose. The, no, the nasal hairs, nose hairs, help to trap things, and also the mucus. And the mucus is produced by cells that line the nasal cavity called the nasal mucosa. So these are, it's a mucous membrane. So in this case, it's a OUS. When we talk about the mucus membrane, it's describing the type of membrane it is. And it produces mucus, the noun, which ends in U-S. And so there's special cells, they're called goblet cells, because they kind of look like a goblet, um, that produce this mucus. And as the air travels past, particulates, dust, pollen, um, microbes can get stuck and trapped there. And then eventually you, you know, blow your nose or pick your nose and eat your boogers, whatever you do. Um, and and gets rid of those that you know the those particles. All right. So uh, after you breathe air in, whether it's through your nose or through your mouth, it eventually goes down past the the pharynx, the throat. So this part here is called the nasopharynx. It's where the nasal passages and the throat meet. And then air can actually go down your esophagus into your stomach, but it preferentially will go in the front pathway here into the trachea, because this is pinched off a little bit when, you are, when your epiglottis is open. Um, so the wider path here is for it to go down into the lungs. Um, so it goes past the voice box, right? Here's my cursor. Here we go. The larynx right here is the voice box, which vibrates when air moves past it and allows us to make, make noise, to speak and sing. And then the trachea is the windpipe. So the trachea you'll see right here extends down into the chest and it looks kind of bony. Those white bands are not bones, but actually cartilage, which is a type of um, bone or connective material. It's just a softer, more flexible version. And you can feel it in your neck. If you feel your neck right here, you can feel your trachea. You can kind of feel it's kind of ribbed. Um, that's the bands of cartilage. And they are there to help keep your trachea open because if your trachea collapses, then the lumen of the trachea is shut and air can't go through. So it's really important that your trachea stays open. So you have these, um, flexible yet sturdy rings or bands of cartilage that help to keep it open at all times. Um, then at the bottom of the trachea, it branches into two branches that are cartilage covered um, until they get into the lungs. And then the lung tissue itself serves as sort of a protective um, coating, I guess, a protective barrier layer. So these two branches are called the bronchi. Bronchi is plural. A single one is a bronchus. So here's the right bronchus and the left bronchus. Remember, it's always the patient's right, 
not your right, as you're looking at the page. Um, and so the right bronchus and left bronchus go into the lungs. And the sort of indentation where they enter the lungs has a special name. It's called the hilum. The hilum is an indentation where like a tube structure enters an organ. So there's other organs that have a hilum as well. The kidneys also have a hilum. And there's two lungs, right lung and a left lung. And they're not quite identical, um, symmetrical, two-sided things. So the right lung actually has more lobes. There are three lobes to the right lung, the right upper, middle, and lower lobe. But the left lung only has two lobes, and you can see them outlined here. It has an upper lobe and a lower lobe. So the reason it's a little bit smaller is, and you can kind of see this cut out here, what do you think fits right here? Hopefully you said the heart or the mediastinum, right? Remember that second cavity within the thoracic cavity, the mediastinum, which can, is actually um, surrounds parts of the trachea, some of the great vessels, the thymus is in there, but the heart is really the big organ that fits right here and the heart is on the left side of the chest and so there's less room for the left lung. So the left lung is a little bit smaller to make room for the heart. As the bronchus, as each bronchus enters the lung, it branches off into smaller branches and we call these smaller branches the bronchioles. That suffix eol, or ol, really, that suffix ol means small thing. So basically, and bronchus actually means branch. So the branch breaks up into smaller branches, these bronchioles. And at the end of these small branches, you have these little grape-like clusters, um, these little bubbles, kind of, which are called the alveoli. So a single one would be an alveolus, and the cluster of them would be alveoli. Or sometimes people say alveolus and alveoli. It's like a tomato tomato thing, either one. Um, so these are colloquially, the layperson term for them is the air sacs of the lungs. And this is where all the action actually happens. So everything else we've talked about, the, the nasal passages, the pharynx, the larynx, the trachea, the, the bronchi, the bronchioles, these are all just tubes to get air to the air sacs. If air doesn't get to the air sacs, then you die. The air sacs is where gas exchange actually occurs, where oxygen enters the blood and carbon dioxide leaves the blood. And so this is the really the functional part of the whole respiratory system right here. The whole respiratory system exists to get air to these air sacs so that you can get actually oxygen to your body. Um, so they're the most important part, the most functional part, everything else, the lung tissue is just there to protect these alveoli. Um, and so when we have an organ like that, that has like a specific functional unit that basically does all the function of the whole system, we call that the parenchyma, the parenchyma of that system. So the alveoli are the parenchyma. They are the workhorses. They are really the sole important part um, that does the sole function of the respiratory system of actually exchanging air, exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide. So as we go down the trachea and the bronchi and the bronchioles, the inner lining is similar in some ways to that nasal the nasal mucosa. So you have mucous membranes that have these goblet cells that produce mucus that help to trap particles so they don't get down into the lungs. And they also have these cilia, these little sort of like eyelashes that stick off the cells. And here's an actual electron micrograph looking at them. And they look kind of like eyelashes. And they actually move, they wave, and they help to move that mucus. They're moving the mucus up the respiratory tract. We call this the mucociliary escalator because it's mucus, it's cilia pushing that mucus up like an escalator. Kind of like you have an up escalator, it's just always moving up 
and it just kind of like keeps rotating so it's but it's always moving people up or you have an escalator always moving people down but in this case the mucociliary escalators constantly moving mucus up and out of the respiratory tract so if you swallow right now i just did all right you're swallowing saliva but you're also actually swallowing some of these mucus secretions from the back of your of your throat that have come up from your respiratory system when you have like a cold or allergies and you're producing excess mucus you really feel that and you cough it up you may cough it up and swallow it down or spit it out um, but all of the time all of the time we are actually doing this so you're always actually swallowing a little bit of mucus from your respiratory tract. It's how we get rid of it. Unless, you know, you hawk a loogie and you spit it out. So the lungs and the respiratory, most of the respiratory system, the lower respiratory system anyway, resides in the thoracic cavity, the chest cavity. And um, a theme that you're gonna see in anatomy and physiology is that our organs are pretty much always surrounded by fluids, that are generated by a membrane. So all of the body cavities are lined with the membrane and the membrane's usually fluid filled. So we saw that with the abdominal cavity, that the, perito the peritoneum is that lining and it does produce a fluid. I didn't really show you um, diagrams of the fluid. In the thoracic cavity, it is lined with a membrane called the pleural membranes. So this is the the plural, the plural membranes here, and there's two of them. So there's an outer membrane and an inner membrane. So the inner membrane is called the visceral pleura, and it lines the lungs itself. It's sort of like the outer lining of the lungs, and I'm trying to trace it with my cursor here. So we call that the visceral pleura because it lines the viscera, the organ here, which is the lung. And then there's the parietal pleura, this is the membrane that lines the outside of that cavity. All right, so that's the parietal pleura. Parietal means wall of a cavity. And then between those two membranes, we have this fluid. All right, the fluid is produced by those pleural membranes. So it's called pleural fluid. And basically, it's there to cushion the lungs. It's kind of like why a fetus grows inside an amniotic sac. A, a sac of fluid helps to provide cushioning and lubrication. So if you think about it, if you think about breathing, when you breathe in, your lungs fill and they expand. And right outside the lungs to protect them are, is the rib cage. So here you can see, uh, sort of zoomed in, the intercostal muscles that help you breathe and then the bony ribs. All right, without that pleural fluid space, your lungs would constantly be hitting the ribs and chafing up against the ribs, which you can imagine would be probably really irritating to the lungs. So you'll notice a theme in anatomy is that all of the major organs, important vital organs, have a fluid membrane surrounding them to help basically cushion and protect them, especially from chafing up against the bones that encase them in order to protect them. All right, um, other things you can see here, here you can see the mediastinum, that sort of inner cavity within the thoracic cavity, the heart's in there. You can see the diaphragm, which is a large sheet of muscle underneath the rib cage that helps to expand and deflate the lungs when you breathe. Um, the ribs, the bony ribs of the rib cage, um, and the combining form for rib that we learned actually back in chapter one was costo. So you can see here the muscles between the ribs are the intercostal muscles. Inter means between. So the name literally means pertaining to between the ribs. The name tells us exactly where those muscles are. A little bit of physiology of the process of respiration. So there's sort of five steps. All right, the first is you need to be able to bring air in. You need to be able to ventilate, move air. And that's a big job of the diaphragm to help ventilation or just pulling air into the lungs and pushing it out, all right? Um, when you bring air into the lungs, it goes ultimately into those air sacs, the alveoli, and you get transfer of, of oxygen from the alveoli into the blood and carbon dioxide 
from the blood into the alve alveoli. So we call that external respiration. Even though the air is in your lungs, it's still not in your body, it's not in your blood. So we're moving air from the external to the internal, to your blood. Then blood needs to be, the, the gas needs to be transported to your cells. All of your cells need oxygen to undergo cellular respiration and make energy. So we need to transport that through the blood and that is um, done through hemoglobin molecules in the red blood cells. They bind to the oxygen and become oxyhemoglobin. And then they get to the oxyhemoglobin reaches the cells or the tissues and internal respiration occurs. So the oxygen moves from the blood into the tissues, into the cells themselves. And then lastly is cellular respiration, using that oxygen to make energy for the cells. And as a byproduct of that energy production, you end up producing carbon dioxide. And then the whole thing goes in reverse. The carbon dioxide leaves the cells, goes into the blood, and gets transported back to the lungs where it moves from the blood into the lungs and you breathe it out. So it's this, this sort of cycle. This is just a picture showing you gas exchange um, at the alveoli. So if you look at the alveoli in this picture here, you can see they're all just wrapped up in capillaries in blood vessels because that's where gas exchange occurs. So they need to have all these blood vessels so they can move the gas from the air sac in the alveoli into, into the blood. Um, and so you can see that here, if you like zoom in, you can see oxygen moving into the blood, binding to hemoglobin in the red blood cells, and carbon dioxide moving out of the blood so that it can be breathed out or expired. So that's the anatomy, basic, very basic anatomy and physiology of the respiratory system, the parts you should know. Um, but we're also going to talk about several diseases of the respiratory system. So starting with asthma. Asthma is a, a, a considered a type of immune problem, an immune reaction, where the immune system actually attacks the bronchioles of the lungs and it causes them to become very inflamed. So you can see this is a normal, healthy bronchiole with some nice, loosely wrapped um, muscles, smooth muscles there. And there's a nice wide open lumen or opening. And there's a you know thick layer of muscle here, but normally thick. If we look at the asthmatic bronchial, we see a lot of thickening from inflammation of that inner lining of the bronchial, and there's a lot of mucus production. And so overall, that lumen is much more narrow, so it's a lot harder for air to pass through and get to the alveoli. Another thing that can really make it hard for asthmatics to breathe is when they have an asthma attack. What's actually happening is the bronchioles are squeezing that smooth or the smooth muscle uh, around the bronchioles contracts and you get bronchoconstriction constriction of that airway from those muscle contractions and so a lot of inhalers are bronchodilators they help to release or loosen those muscles so that the bronchioles are wider the lumens are wider and you can breathe more easily but there's sort of a chronic inflammation that occurs in, in asthmatics. So the reason that they have to take sort of maintenance medications is to reduce that level of inflammation that's just kind of a chronic system. So another term for asthma is reactive airway disease because it involves these immune reactions in the airway. Another common disease of the respiratory system, we're still sort of like, um, Oh, I guess asthma is more of a lower respiratory system disease. Laryngitis, okay, the, when the larynx becomes inflamed or infected, um, you lose your voice. So anytime you lose your voice, that's a case of laryngitis. And it could be from overuse. So you've just inflamed the larynx, like from talking too much. Or it could be from an infection, like a bacteria or virus that causes it. Bronchitis is an infection in the bronchi. So it's a lower respiratory infection um, and often involves a lot of excess mucus production. So a bronchitis usually involves a lot of 
coughing of mucus from the chest. An upper respiratory infection would be one of the, you know, nasal passages, the sinuses, um, even the, the nasopharynx. And these are commonly referred to as URIs, upper respiratory infections, or just a cold, like a head cold. It's a really common um, sort of layperson name for it. And common cold or head cold, these upper respiratory infections can progress into bronchitis because you can get that post-nasal drip where you know mucus drips and drains from the nose nasal passage down into the larynx and trachea and then you end up with a lower respiratory infection so taking good care of yourself during an upper respiratory infection can help it from progressing to an additional infection and it's why colds and coughs often coincide and go together and last for so long because oftentimes it's progressing from one part of the respiratory system to the next. Um, some different breathing conditions. Apnea. This is a word that means without breathing. A is a prefix that means without. Pnea is a word part that means breathing. So if somebody is a common form of apnea that people know about is sleep apnea, where people stop breathing while they're sleeping for brief periods and then you know, wake up or breathe, take in a deep breath. Um, so if somebody is not breathing, like a patient stops breathing, they would be reported or charted as apneic. You might record how long that lasted for. Bradypnea, remember brady means slow. So this would be a slow breathing rate. There's breathing rate is one of your vital signs. So I don't actually know what the normal breathing rate is but the doctors will check that your breathing rate is normal. And if it's low, that's a sign, a sign that something is wrong. Dyspnea means difficult or abnormal or painful breathing. Um, a lot of times this is also just called shortness of breath. When you're having difficulty breathing or you feel like there's something like a weight on your chest and it's painful, um, it, that's most often referred to as shortness of breath, but will be charted a lot of times as dyspnea. So dyspnea is the medical term for shortness of breath, which is often abbreviated as SOB, not to be confused with son of a bee. Um, orthopnea, ortho is a new medical term for us. It means straight and pnea is breathing. So this is a condition where you can only breathe in an upright position. And a lot of patients have this condition, and then it's the nurse's job to help adjust the patient into an upright position so they can breathe better. Um, tachypnea would be the opposite of bradypnea. It would be fast breathing rate. And um, so a fast breathing rate can be like from a fever, sometimes fevers can elicit tachypnea, a fast breathing rate. Um, hyperventilation is another type of fast breathing where you're not ventilating the air properly. You end up breathing out too much carbon dioxide. Um, so um, there's normal, normal tachypnea, which is hyperpnea when you, uh, like, or when you're exercising, okay? So being winded should correlate with the amount of activity that you're doing. But some people, even at rest, their breathing rate is very fast, and that's not normal. It's normal for your breathing rate to be fast when you're running, but not when you're sitting. Some other lung diseases, some respiratory distress syndrome. So adult respiratory distress syndrome occurs when the lungs fill with fluid, inflammatory fluid. And so you end up with um, this fluid buildup, the fluid sort of fills the air sacs and blocks gas exchange. And so you can't breathe because there's there your lungs are full of fluid and they're full of fluid that is made by your lungs and your in your immune system. This was one of the early things that was noted with um, coronavirus with COVID SARS-CoV-2 that it was being it was um, particularly deadly because it was eliciting this strong immune response that caused the lungs to fill with fluid um, from inflammation 
due to trying to fight this virus. And that's what killed a lot of people, especially young people, um, people in their 20s and 30s. That, that um, ARDS is actually like an over-response to the immune system, of the immune system. Infant respiratory distress is different. This is due to a lack of surfactant production and is very common in premature infants whose lungs aren't fully developed yet. They're not making surfactant yet. And so their alveoli, when you breathe, your alveoli open and close and open and close and open and close. And the reason they can open, again, is because of this surfactant, which makes it kind of slippery and not sticky. But without the surfactant, the alveoli are kind of sticky, and when they close, then they can't reopen properly. So that's what happens in newborns. Though technology, neonatal technology, has really improved and the, the survival of and um, the treatment of respiratory distress syndrome in infants. There's artificial like um, surfactant that they can pump, like put a baby on like a respirator where they breathe in the surfactant. Um, there's injections that they can give mom while she's in labor that um, speed up the lung development and surfactant development. So the, the death rate from respiratory distress has gone down significantly in the last decade or two, uh, but it used to be a major cause of death in premature infants. Atelectasis is a type of lung collapse. So when the lungs, it's kind of like respiratory distress syndrome, infant respiratory distress syndrome, where the lungs, those alveoli collapse and they can't reopen. Um, some lung diseases, other lung diseases, Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, which is very common in smokers. So here's normal, healthy lungs and a heart. And this is one with COPD. So you can see there's a lot of inflammation and swelling in the lumen of the bronchioles. The alveoli are swollen. So basically damage is um, people not getting enough oxygen in due to breathing in a lot of carcinogens and smoke, um, their alveoli swell and the bronchioles dilate and swell um, and become inflamed and they don't take in oxygen as well even though they're trying to. Um, these are some lungs and a heart of a patient with COPD. You can see that the lungs in a healthy person are kind of pointy. Forgot to mention this but the pointy top of the lung is called the apex of the lung. And this flat bottom part here is called the base. So normally the apex is, is sort of pointy and rounded, but you can see in someone with COPD, it's kind of squared up here. And so people with COPD, one of the signs is, is that they're barrel chested. Their chest actually sort of widens because of the tops of their lungs widening in this shape. You also will notice that the heart is much larger. That's because the lungs are not getting as much oxygen, and so the heart has to work harder and pump more blood because there's less oxygen in the blood, but the tissues still need that, the right amount of oxygen, so the, the heart has to work that much harder. And although the heart is a muscle, and we usually think of working your muscles out makes them bigger and makes them stronger, the heart is an exception. Overworking the heart actually weakens the heart muscle. An over large heart is actually a sign of an exhausted heart, not a strong one. So um, you see that it also affects the heart. Um, lung cancer is cancer of the lungs. These are usually solid tumors. You can see a lung tumor here in a lung probably of a smoker just looking at the tar deposits there versus a sliver from a healthy lung, which is nice and pink. There are different occupational lung diseases from breathing in particles, from breathing in like dust particles. So we call these a pneumoconiosis, which literally means a condition of breathing in dust. Um, and so some of these conditions that are well known are coal miners disease, coal miners lung, which is called anthracosis from breathing in coal dust. You see pictures of coal miner and they're just covered 
in coal dust, they're breathing that in as well. And that can accumulate in the lungs over time and cause inflammation. Another um, classic one is asbestosis. Asbestos workers breathing in the asbestos, which is like these little fine glass silica particulates. They're so small, they stay suspended in the air and you breathe them in. And then they sort of puncture the lungs and they cause inflammation in the lungs, which gives you a cough. They can also cause um, the lung to develop a specific type of cancer called mesothelioma, which um, was very common in asbestos workers before we had really the safety precautions that we have now for working with asbestos. Um, cystic fibrosis, or CF for short, is a genetic condition. So you're born with it, it's congenital, and it's genetic. So there's a gene for it. I mean, babies are all tested at birth to see if they have cystic fibrosis. And it's a disease that causes basically a lot of excess mucus in certain organs. It inclu it's particularly dangerous in the lungs. So you get, you know, mucus in small amounts is protective. It traps particulates and helps move them out. But mucus in large amounts can become a blockage or it can become a site where bacteria sort of plant themselves and then grow if you can't effectively clear it. And so this is actually a treatment, it's an older treatment. I mean, this picture looks like it's from the 70s or 80s, but it's still something that's done um, to help. It's therapeutic for CF patients where you lay them down at an angle and you do percussion on their chest just to help move that mucus up and out of the respiratory system. There's also some drugs that have been helpful, but it's still a disease that um, takes lives young. So people with cystic fibrosis, they you can't tell looking at them. There's no, no signs of it, but um, they do have a shortened life expectancy and they're much more prone to respiratory infections. And those respiratory infections can be deadly quickly, more so than in a healthy individual. Um, and so I think the life expectancy of someone with cystic fibrosis is around 40 years right now. And there are a lot of organizations that are raising money and conducting research to increase that and to improve the treatment, including potential genetic therapies for cystic fibrosis. Um, empyema and pyothorax are synonyms. Lena, do you mind? Can you go turn that alarm off? Thank you. Thank you, whoever turned off my alarm. Um, all right, so pyothorax, pyo, not to be confused with pyro, means pus. So um, pyo means pus, pyro means fire. Uh, so empyema and pyothorax both have that combining form. So it means a buildup of pus, basically from an infection, a lung infection. Um, another term for pus is purulent like purulent, so something that's pussy is purulent. Um, and bronchiectasis, ectasis means dilation of. So this is a swelling or dilation of the bronchioles. And that happens in people with cystic fibrosis as a response to try to, the bronchioles naturally sort of swell and dilate to try to get more air because they're so covered in mucus or full of mucus. Some different lung infections, and there's more in the textbook that I'm not going through, so these are the ones you should focus on. Influenza, this is the influenza virus here, a falsely, you know, a, a, um, a artificially colored picture there, but that's what the virus particles look like. And the reason you want to get your flu shot, because influenza is a pretty serious, can be a pretty serious virus. If it doesn't kill you, it makes you pretty sick, and then you kind of want to die but it is particularly dangerous for people who are very old and for very, who are very young and thousands of people every year die from the flu. Um, we do have a vaccine for it. It's not the most perfect vaccine. It's only about, depending on the year, 30 to 60% effective. So it doesn't give you 100% protection, but 30 to 60% is better than 0%. Um, so I always encourage people to get their flu shots. Legionnaire's disease is just one that has a funny story. It's an eponym. It's named after the American Legion. And so that's why it's called Legionnaire's disease. The bacteria that causes it is called Legionella. 
and it's because it was discovered in the 90s in Philadelphia at a hotel where there was an American Legion convention. And so it was a bunch of, you know, retired veterans who um, were all older and several of them came down with pneumonia during the convention or right after the convention. And they realized that it was due to this bacteria that was in the air conditioning cooling tanks at the hotel. And it was um, being circulated through the air, through the ventilation of the hotel air conditioning system. And so all of these, you know, elderly people were breathing it in and several of them became sick. So it's a more of an opportunistic pathogen. It doesn't usually make young people sick, but it can make old people sick. Um, tuberculosis, which is often abbreviated as just TB, is a pretty old disease. Um, it's a bacterial infection of the lungs that can um, be dormant or be active and can be very dangerous and very difficult to treat. There are antibiotics for it, but you have to take them for like several months or a year. And a lot of times um, people's symptoms go away, so they stop taking their meds and then um, the tuberculosis gets worse and also becomes resistant to treatment. So um, you may not know anyone who's had tuberculosis, but it is still fairly common in the U.S. There's still several thousands of cases a year, um, but it's globally a major killer. In, in undeveloped countries, it runs rampant. And a lot of people, a lot of Americans get it when they're traveling um, to these other countries. So um, it's definitely one, it's one of the top three killers, infectious disease killers in the world. Um, so it's still a very big problem, even though we've controlled it a lot in the U.S. And in a lot of developed countries, a lot of undeveloped countries have not. Pneumonia is a condition of an infection of the lungs, basically. So it, you can have viral pneumonia, you can have bacterial pneumonia, you can have very mild cases that you just feel kind of sick, and you have very severe cases where you can barely breathe and you're hospitalized. So um, there's lots of different, sort of, there's like a spectrum of different um, outcomes and diagnoses with pneumonia, but the word pneumonia it means a condition of the lungs. It's really an infection of the lungs. Um, some other lung diseases, a pulmonary embolism. An embolus is a um, blockage. It's usually a blood clot, but it could be like a fat clot or something else. But a lot of times it is a, a blood clot um, that, that gets loose and travels in through the blood and then gets stuck in a blood vessel. Um, and blocks blood flow and causes a blockage. So if this happens in the pulmonary arteries, the ones that feed the lungs, then it's kind of like a stroke in the lungs. Like a stroke is a blood clot in the brain, a blockage of blood flow to the brain. This is a blockage of blood flow to the lungs and it affects your ability to breathe. So you can have small ones where a blood clot gets, gets stuck in a small um, artery um, where only part of the lung becomes blocked, and that might cause some difficulty breathing and some chest pain, um, but maybe you take some blood thinners and it goes away, it clears up, and it's fine. If you get a pulmonary embolism in the pulmonary artery that comes from the heart and it blocks blood flow to an entire lung, you basically drop dead right there, and there's no true, I mean, maybe if you're already on a hospital bed, like already on the surgical table, they can clear it and restore your breathing. But otherwise, it's, um, it's, that's a pretty, pretty fast killer right there. So my story about this was one of the few years ago when I was teaching, when I was pregnant with my daughter, and I was on this slide in the lecture, and one of my students pipes up, because I love when students, like, you know, relay their stories like I like to, you know, tell stories about, oh, when I had some experience with this. So I had this one student in the front row and she she piped up and she was like, oh, my friend died of that when during labor and of a pulmonary embolism. And it is a, a potential complication of surgeries and of labor to develop blood clots that then can cause these embol these emboli 
a blockage in one of them could be in the lungs. And I looked at her with my pregnant belly and I was like, really? You're really going to tell a pregnant woman that your friend died of a pulmonary embolism during labor? Thanks. Thanks a lot for freaking me out. But I said it with good humor, but it was kind of, kind of a funny thing to blurt out to a pregnant woman. Um, but yeah, so that can happen. A uh, hemothorax is blood in the chest cavity. It usually comes from trauma to the chest. That you end up with bleeding in the chest. In, in like that pleural space around the lungs, that can just basically cause added pressure um, on the lungs and it makes it hard for them to expand so you can't breathe well. Um, you can also get pleural effusion, which is a buildup of, of pleural fluid from inflammation. Um, and pneumothorax is getting gas in or air in that pleural space. So picture those pleural membranes surrounding the lungs here. If you get blood or extra fluid or extra air in there, it basically suffocates. It starts smothering the lungs. It builds up pressure in the pleural space and the lungs can't expand. And so you get this real shortness of breath. It's hard to breathe. And so the, the treatment for it is um, a thoracentesis, sticking a, a like syringe into the lungs and pulling out either the air or the blood or the excess pleural um, fluid in order to release that pressure. A lot of medical shows have really dramatic scenes with a thoracentesis using like a straw or some, you know, like whatever tool is on hand. Um, pneumothorax is also very commonly referred to as a collapsed lung because it does cause the lung to kind of, you can't breathe. I don't know that I would really think of it as collapsed, but the term collapsed lung is usually referring to pneumothorax and must be treated with a thoracentesis to release that gas and release that pressure. Some of the signs of lung diseases include a cough. Um, some of the terms for cough are this, so this suffix here, optesis, it means cough. So hemoptesis is a bloody cough where you're coughing up bloody um, sputum. Um, another one is tusso, and we'll see that when we talk about cough medication. Of when you're coughing, a lot of times you're coughing up material. Um, if you like, if you have bronchitis, you might be coughing up sputum. So that's expectoration. Um, you're coughing out of your chest. Pecto is chest. Um, there's also different uh, signs in your blood gases that you can measure. So hypoxia or anoxia, a, a low or no oxygen condition. And um, this can be from poor breathing, or it could be from poor circulation. That's not getting oxygen to tissues that need it. Asphyxia is an inability to breathe. So like cutting off your air supply um, is to asphyxiate. So like choking can cause asphyxiation. If you have a blockage of something um, lodged in your throat or somebody choking, you know, wrapped around your neck causes asphyxia. Hypoxemia is a lack or a low amount of oxygen in the blood um, and can be measured by measuring arterial gases. Cyanosis is a sign that your blood oxygen level is low because you're turning blue. Cyan is a blue color and so cyanosis is a condition of bluing from low oxygen. And hypercapnia is having too much carbon dioxide. Capnia or capno is a combining form for carbon dioxide. So a few lab procedures that can be done to diagnose respiratory conditions. You can measure the amount of oxygen in the blood doing oximetry, which is usually done with a little finger sensor. Super easy, totally painless, and measures your blood oxygenation level. The maximum is 100%. Um, if it drops below, I think, 95 or 92, that's concerning. Um, spirometry is what's shown in this picture here, 
So using a spirometer, which measures sort of the strength of your breathing. And this will be done in people who have asthma or who are recovering from lung disease to sort of measure the strength of their lungs. Polysomnography, somno means sleep. This is a sleep recording. So, and this is usually looking for people um, to diagnose people with sleep apnea because you often don't realize that you have it. You just feel really tired in the morning, like you're not getting good, good sleep. And then you go to a sleep lab and they record your, you during, your breathing during sleep and can determine whether you have it or not. Um, if you have a respiratory infection, a lot of times you'll get a swab um, and they'll do a culture and sensitivity test. So that's often abbreviated as a CNS where they basically swab the bacteria onto a Petri dish and then they look for whether it's sensitive to different antibiotics so they know what to treat you with. So this is a, a CNS test. Um, to look for tuberculosis, and any one of you who's working in healthcare will be tested for tuberculosis because they don't want healthcare workers to have tuberculosis and be passing it on to patients. Um, so anyone who works in a hospital has to be tested for tuberculosis, and that test is an injection in, under the skin of some tuberculin protein. Sorry, the background is my, my husband and my neighbor talking. I hope it's not too distracting. Um, so it's called a Manto test, or more commonly it's called the PPD test. And they just inject some tuberculin protein into um, under your skin, and they look for swelling. So they look come back a couple days later to see if there's a reaction. If there is a reaction, then they're going to double check that by doing a chest x-ray to look for cloudy areas that represent bacterial growth. Um, and same thing for if they're testing a patient for tuberculosis. Some different medical procedures or surgical procedures of the respiratory system. Auscultation, of course, is listening, using a stethoscope to the chest. That's very common. Percussion might be done if there's sound of fluid in the chest. The doctor might do some percussion to look for where those areas of fluid filling are. Um, CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation if someone is not breathing. Endotracheal intubation is what's shown here, where it's a tube that's stuck down the trachea if CPR is not working, if a patient is not breathing, or if there's an obstruction if the trachea is collapsed, then they stick um, this tracheal tube down there and then they stick a ventilator bag or attach you to a machine that pumps air directly into the lungs. So when we talk about like COVID patients who are on ventilators, they are intubated. They have these tubes stuck down their trachea and air is being pumped directly into their lungs. Oxygen therapy is just putting on like a facial mask. Now my dog is running around making background noise. You get all, all the uh, all the household noises in this video. Um, so oxygen therapy is when you just have like a facial mask that's pumping high oxygen air that you can breathe. So it just increases your oxygen pressure, um, but it's not invasive. It doesn't like go into your lungs. It's just a mask on your face. Um, a tracheostomy is what's pictured in this picture here where it's a hole a stoma, it's an ostomy procedure, to make a surgically created opening in the trachea so that um, they can bypass the trachea if there's like a blockage in the trachea. And it's another, um, I guess, way to get air into the lungs besides intubation is to have this ostomy. Now, some people have a permanent tracheostomy if they've had such extensive damage to their trachea from cancer or from smoking or from even like congenital deformities they may need a permanent tracheostomy in order to breathe. And then thoracentesis, we said, is an, a procedure to puncture, puncture the thorax in order to withdraw fluid or gas or blood or whatever that's um, building up there. And then lastly, the drug categories to treat um, respiratory uh, problems. Um, respiratory diseases. Antibiotics would be given for an infection to treat an infection. An antitussive, tusso is another combining form for cough. So an antitussive is an anti-cough medication and there's a lot of over-the-counter um, cough medications. I always tell people um, 
a little bit like word to the wise, like consumer advice, when you're buying medications, actually read the labels and read the ingredients. You may not understand what the ingredients are, but right next to the ingredient, it says what the purpose of that ingredient is. So like Robitussin is a really common brand of cough medication, but there's like 10 different flavors or versions of Robitussin to treat different symptoms. So if you just have a cough and you wanna stop coughing, look for an antitussive. Look at the ingredients and look for ones that the active ingredient is an antitussive. There are several that have multiple ingredients. They treat, um, uh, they both, they, maybe they, they are fevered, they have an anti-fever um, component and an anti-cough and an, a decongestant. All right, so just when, you're, when you have a cold, take medications that address just the symptoms you have. You don't wanna overdo it. You don't need to take um, too many different ingredients to treat different symptoms that you don't have. So don't just like grab any bottle off the shelf or take whatever multi-symptom cold medication you have in your drug cabinet get one that actually treats the symptoms you have. So an antitussive is good if you have a dry cough and that the frequency of your coughing is what's really bothering you and like keeping you up at night. If you have a chest cold and you have a lot of mucus and you want to like thin out that mucus so you can cough it up better, all right, that's what an expectorant does. An expectorant helps you to cough up medication. Sometimes you'll find a drug that's both an antitussive and an expectorant. So it thins out the mucus and it makes you cough less. But an expectorant, one that's just an expectorant, doesn't usually make you cough less. It just makes your coughs more productive because it helps to thin out the mucus so you're not like gagging on it. Sorry if that's a, not a pleasant mental picture. And then here you have somebody using an inhaler which contains a bronchodilator. So bronchodilators dilate or widen the bronchioles when you're having an asthma attack. So um, people who take regular asthma medication, like on a daily basis, what they're usually taking are anti-inflammatories that keep the inflammation down versus an inhaler, which is for just when you're having an attack um, and that does something different. It actually relaxes the smooth muscles and prevents those, the spasming that occurs. So that's the end of the chapter four lecture. Um, it's actually a little bit longer than I thought it would be, but uh, hope you enjoy. Bye.